Welcome to the Transform Sales Podcast, where forward-thinking business leaders come to share their experiences and ideas, learn from each other, and amplify their results together. Hey guys, Amir Ryder here with the Transform Sales Podcast. I got my guest, Matt Witte. I, pro- I always pronounce it wrong um, with, abstract mar- it. with abstract marketing. Um, coming, coming to us from Nelly's studio, right? Yeah, I'm actually sitting in Nelly's old recording and producing studio. Um, that's actually one of our facilities. He used to have a school here in St. Louis, and we took it over the facility, and he left a whole bunch of music recording and producing st- uh, equipment. So, you know, right next to me, I've got about a 130 channel uh, mixer that, that uh, is obsolete because everything's on the computer nowadays. Um, and then there's a grand piano and a, a silent room right over there. You just sell it I'm back. You just sell it back to Nelly. Yeah, we, <laughs> we well, he left it here because he couldn't get it anything out. They built the room around all the equipment, so he couldn't get. There's no physical way of getting the equipment out of so here. Wasn't, so. It wasn't the best planning. No, no, not on the front end. The GCs kind of kind of messed with them pretty big there. It's, it's, <laughs> so it's all good. But I do. I appreciate you taking the time to to, to be on the, the podcast. I'm excited about this one. We've been talking almost every other day for, for the last six months or so. Um, I know you've, you've, you've been at Abstract for such a long time and, and moving to a new position, but I'd love to start off with, with the listeners, just kind of maybe giving a high level of how you got into the outsourced sales business to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. So actually this story goes way back. Um, I, I had the exact same internship that one of the partners here had uh, 13 years after him. So um, by nature of, of doing the business development work at Wells Fargo at the time, uh, his was with a, a different financial firm. I was introduced to the partner and, and started off on the front lines uh, here, really helping building solid pipelines, acting as more of that sales development rep. That was, gosh, better part of 12 years ago now. Um, did that role for a couple of years. And I've really helped grow the, the organization and um, you know, starting off from the ground level, uh, held a couple of sales manager roles and, and help deploy teams and, and build out what our infrastructure looks like here today. And nowadays I'm, I'm selling for the company. So, so for those listening, there's a common thread here. Matt was really good at a hard thing. So good at a hard thing that he got in the business of the hard thing. Is that, that's is, right. Is, is, that's is, right. <laughs> so, so, so maybe you can tell a little bit about abstract marketing. I know you guys are one of the, one of the, the bigger companies. You've got a lot of services. It'd be great to have a high level for those listening. A lot of the agencies we work with are, are smaller. Abstract apps have been around for what, 15, 20 years now. Maybe a quick, yep. quick yeah, level. So, uh, been around since 2009. Um, I joined the company in 2011. I was number 12 way back when. So by label, we're a business growth agency. So anything that's going to impact the bottom line and help a business grow, we want to help them do that. Yeah. Right. So four primary ways that, that we've done that are divisions of our business. We've got our outbound side, which acts as more of an outsourced inside sales department for B2B organizations, really doing the legwork of establishing and building the pipeline from the ground level up. You know, identifying decision makers, playing that timing and relationship game as if they were right there in, in our client's office, right? And acting as an extension of their business, um, facilitating a consistent flow of meetings. And you guys um, are U.S. based, that. right? For all those buyers yeah. out there, well, you made in America. Matt is yeah. made in America and so is abstract marketing. I can't even get him to visit yeah. Columbia. I've been trying. <laughs> he won't visit. Yeah, we're uh, we're 578 employees strong, all in St. Louis, Missouri. So we're not outsourcing anything, or or you know we'll, we'll eventually have to build out second and third office spaces. But we've made it work here in St. Louis so far. Nah, you'll uh, you'll, you'll, you'll always so. be able to make it work. I like that. So so for <laughs> for those listening and map yourself, you know what we like to do in the show is is you know oftentimes we have people listening that have have tried outsourcing before. And in their minds, it didn't go so well and, and it failed, but you know, they need revenue, so they're back at it. And um, mm-hmm. some are trying for the first time. The idea is just to be super transparent with mistakes that buyers make so that, that potentially sure. people listening can put themselves in the shoes of the agencies who oftentimes want to deliver amazing work. I never met an agency that did not want to deliver an ROI. That, that doesn't really exist. Mm-hmm. Um, just so hopefully that they, they might not make those mistakes and be able to get the revenue goals. So um, maybe you could start off with what comes to mind. Like what what's the most common mistake that you see buyers making when meeting with you? Sure, sure. Um, the big thing is that I see coming into it is um, an expectation that we are magic, um, I guess, uh, 
magicians, if you will. Um, what we're doing is, is exactly what you said earlier. We're doing the hard work that, that no one wants to do or has the capacity to do, right? They can do it, right? But they nor- normally don't have one of those two options at their fingertips, right? Yeah. So if, if I come into a partnership um, and notice how I use the word partnership, because really we're here to build the pipeline where we're not closing the business though. So we need a, a partner that has strong value propositions, knows their differentiation points, knows their competition. And if they, they have those, um, you know, kind of check boxes marked off, if you will, then they're going to be in a much better position than somebody that, that has belief, right. Or, or is relying more on hope. Yeah. Um, so really focusing in on value propositions, which have to come from the company, right. They, they have to be backed up by the organization that's ultimately going to fulfill, right. I, I can come up and bring best practices to the table and, and share with you what's worked um, for other people. But ultimately that's, that's the crux. Right. That's what oh, you make. You mixed a few things in. You mixed a few things in. Right. Yeah. Let's let's slow this down. So right off the yeah. right, <laughs> off the, right off the bat, buyers are making a mistake by just coming in to buy something with the expectations of because I'm buying it, it should be easy. And that's not mm-hmm. really aligned with why they're outsourcing. Right. So kind of just coming in. Right. If you're kind of coming in being like, oh, I can do this internally. It's really hard. It's really difficult. But now that I'm working with an mm-hmm. agency, I'm going to make sure it's really easy. It's, mm-hmm. it's not changing the fact that it's really hard. So if you're coming in, if your expectations now come in being like, because I'm not doing this internally, because I'm working with abstract, now it's easy. That's not reality, right? Reality is that right. it doesn't, it doesn't change the hard thing about hard things. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, a hundred percent. Right. It's, it, it's as if they were doing it themselves, we're going to be um, subjected to the same objections, the same, you know, barriers of entry that they've seen. Right. And and we can bring, like I said earlier, best practices to the table or told tell you that prospect what's worked for another partner in the past. But ultimately they've got to back that up. Yeah. Well you right? you so flowed it, it right you to... flowed into when I asked you the mistakes, you flowed into mm-hmm. what we just confirmed into the actual not having a buyer persona or having a compelling event because it goes hand in hand where it's like not only totally do, not only do you as a buyer have to have the right mindset, but your product has to have the right offering because you can have a mix of both. You can have a customer mm-hmm. with the wrong mindset with a really good offering and they can get some of the right. results or a mindset with really good mindset. We're in this together. We're teammates, but a really bad offering and you can't help that person either. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like mm-hmm. almost these two things need to align up where a buyer needs to understand. Yeah. A great example of that is reputation. Right. If and we experienced this with a real estate company down in Florida, it just stands out to me where they had a terrible reputation. There was a broker that just bombarded the industry and and didn't uh, really represent the organization um, very well uh, and ended up leaving the, the business, but left a very bad reputation yeah. you know, that was associated to that brand. So it, it caused that barrier to be really great. Um, and it's something that's, that's beyond our control. We can help it over time, right. Yeah. And rebuild that brand, but it's not something that's going to be, Hey, just because you're using an outsourced firm that they're not going to experience it anymore. Yeah. And this is something that Tito board for the Alti sales brought up, which is he referred to as like the, the bad sales debt, right? Like what is the cost of like volume amounts of calls and emails, and, and in mm-hmm. this concept of like, we want more, 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 and it creates what you just mentioned, which is bad sales debt with all of a sudden a person can hit up a whole marketplace and have a bad reputation, right? Uh, that, that, that makes Sa- oversaturation, right? Yeah. Or just like not listening, right? Like there's sometimes people mm-hmm. where I'm nice to you and I'm like, Hey man, I'm just not going to be at you. I haven't been somebody for six months, um, reach back in six months. And they take that as an opportunity to call me and pitch me. And I'm like, now I don't fucking like you, right? Like I left the right. door open. If you just nurtured me on social media, you like my post, you commented, you want to have me in your, 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 and I, I, I ripped somebody on that today. Cause he was like pitching me. He's like, give me, give me your payroll service. I was like, bro, I don't have payroll. I don't have W2s. I'm in Columbia, you know, like, and kept, right. trying, kept trying to pitch me. And I was just trying to be nice, but uh, yeah, sales debt guys doing sales the wrong way can also be a, a problem. So we got a lot of moving parts. We're like, Hey, your mind, your mindset has to be right. You need to understand the fact that this is how B2B sales works. You have to have a good offering. And at the same time, you need to know what your current marketplace really, where they are at. Like, do they know about your brand for the last 10 years? Like abstract marketing, you guys have been around for a long time. I've spoken to people mm-hmm. who come to us who I, you know, I, they, they ask like, Oh, do you guys work? Do you have abstract in your marketplace? Of course we do. They, they know you guys, they know your name. Right. 
uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's also pros and cons, right? There's some times where there can right. be a bad review, and you could be guys could be great at something, or because that's also the the, the negative. Part oh, about totally, it, you know, totally, totally, right? You know, and that that just plays into the the rep or the kind of status quo of reviews, right? The, the people who are, the people who are happy clients. don't fucking leave them. <laughs> Right, yeah, right, exactly. They, you know, yeah. yeah. It's like nobody so, who's happy yeah. is leaving a positive review. They're busy, and then anybody who's 100%. unhappy. So it's this really skewed system. I uh, absolutely. You know, that's the the power of what nowadays. But <laughs> but you, Matt, as an individual, have a perfect review score. That I can that I can put my name behind. I, it's hey, there. We go. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Which, appreciate that. Which is, which is good. So so now that like people listening, right? That's a big thing. But it's still it's still not easy to to educate. Um, a buyer, what do you do during a sales process to kind of convey the message to a buyer being like, Hey, you know, you're at the right place, but you're, you're, we need to get your expectations and get your, your product aligned with what you expect. Like, what do you, what do you do to, to try to yeah. align that? The, I would say the crux of that, the, what's first and foremost above everything is you've got to establish rapport. Right. You've got to have a level of trust in between you and that prospect before you can even attempt any sort of objection handling or getting them in an education process, right? Where you're trying to teach them, you know, this is the way you need to go, but here's the check boxes that you need to get taken care of first, mm-hmm. right? Like like the value proper differentiator, et cetera. So really it's it's a kind of a hand holding conversation that you gotta have and you really got to come from a consultative um sort of approach. They have to be willing to have the conversation with you up front, but um you, you also do, have you know to what I'm picturing? Um, I'm picturing like one that? of those like Instagram short videos of like a cat at like a veterinary place where like the guy's trying to calm down the cat. Like, like, like yeah. now that you trust me, I can help you. Right. So, so <laughs> right. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's yeah. it. You know, and, and having case studies or, or what I found to be really effective or the most effective is stories, right? If I can tell that person that we've seen that situation, it may not be the exact industry, the exact same timelines, the exact same, whatever, but the overall arching, um, uh, issue was addressed in a certain way that we were able to help them get from point. Wait, a to this point. is like the, this is like the Nelly story you gave me before the podcast. You're trying to get right. you're trying to gain podcast trust. <laughs> exactly. Fucking exactly. A. So you see how Matt starts, <laughs> off, starts off with the story about Nelly. I'm all comfortable. I'm looking at the sign. I'm go. looking at a sign in the background. I'm like, I need to get myself a Nelly sign or a transfer <laughs> sales file. <laughs> now you got podcast trust. So, with me. There you go. There you go. And it's the grow show. If you guys want to check it out, yeah, there you go. Uh, a weekly <laughs> pod class, you know, there's my plug. <laughs> I like it. I, I like it. So, so let's talk about, so, so buyers, obviously there, there are mistakes that are made during the buying cycle. Mm-hmm. Right. But ultimately we are in a business that, that is, it's not about the sale. It's about the execution. How does this flow into mistakes they make when working with you? Right. Um, sure. Yeah, there's. What's the most What's the most common adage. mistake you see when working with you? Yeah, it's the old adage of don't confuse selling with installing, and there's and it ties back into what we were talking about earlier with education during the sales process, right? If somebody's sale is the crux of that sale and getting that person to actually move on it. If there's such a high level of education that needs to get to it, that's, that's going to be really hard um, or very long cycle from cold all the way to that point. Right. So the, the cycle that you're, they're looking at um, from a a timeline standpoint needs to be accounted for. Um, And oftentimes I see companies only account for after engagement not leading up to engagement. So that's, that's huge. And that impacts sales cycles. That'll impact, you know, your expectation from forecasting, right. Mm. And, and how, how much top of the funnel activity I need to have versus middle versus bottom of the funnel activity, so on and so forth. So I see that all the time where, where that confusion or that gap is, is just not realized. How many times have you seen a buyer admit that their sales cycle was nine months, but expect a sale in six months? (laughs) <laughs> it's um I, what i see more often amir is i hear a 30 90 day sales cycle and you and i both know those only exist in areas where you're selling widgets or a very transactional based sale yeah or just, or just right place right timing right like or right. like or like right. they're about to sign a contract with salesforce they look at the bill 85k and you're like right. uh, sugar force i'm 30 percent cheaper than salesforce they're like 
fine, I'll talk to you. That that can happen, but don't count your blessing totally. on it. No, uh, that's the hope, yeah. right? But leading up to that point, right? What, even in that scenario, there was something leading up to that point of, okay, I'll look into it mm -hmm. that led to that sale that wasn't accounted for. And that's usually the prospecting piece, right? Of where they've told, you no once or twice or six times before. It's the right, awareness year, zone. Two you get in the awareness Exactly. Zone. It's that top of the funnel activity yeah. that us marketers play in, right? That's where all of our activity goes. It's, it's, it's in that top of the funnel activity. And then that'll translate down into what the salespeople and, and ultimately the closers want to get to, which is people that are ready and willing to meet with them to talk about working with one another. Yeah. And like, and like even, even to that topic, like, you know, even a podcast like this, if someone, mm -hmm. if someone is a potential buyer of outside sales services, two, three years down the line, they might be listening to this podcast and they might be learning some stuff. They might be aware of CloudTask's marketplace. They might be aware of, of abstract. Do they decide to come mm -hmm. through a marketplace? If it benefits them, do they want to go directly to you? But they can, but now they're aware of both, right? Right. Um, so it's right. interesting people listening to this can also think of like, Hey, what content am I producing to support our SDRs? What kind of, 100%. you know, what kind of thing, what kind of stuff am I doing to make sure that if I hire mm -hmm. an abstract marketing, that they're going to be calling people that are aware of our brand, right? They need to start seeing the, the big picture. Um, mm -hmm. so, so now we know we, we got the mistakes they make when buying, right. Which is just like not understanding, um, what, what's in, involved, not really taking a look at the mirror and saying, well, would, would I answer an email? You know, a lot of the times buyers that, that are buying outside sales service have probably seen this. They hate salespeople. They hate sales. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, my product's the best, blah, 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 blah. I raise 80 million. Sure. And you're like, man, if I did that to you, you'd say fuck off. Right. To me. But now you right. expect the buyer. Right. So like, do you think that people struggle with like this concept of first person like do you, do you ever like see a buyer able to like put themselves in the shoes of the person you're calling or is there like this disconnect because i know it's a disconnect and i'm just curious right. to see what you see where they're like they don't buy they don't want you oh, to yeah. sell the way they buy it's, it's there it's there in almost a hundred percent of our our sales processes um and that's where i've been lucky in my my sales career to have become I guess, um, savvy to that very early on. And I saw whenever I, I became savvy to it, I saw a distinct jump in my sales, right? I, there was a point in time where I, I had like a two or three X on my monthly sales number because I, as a seller became more savvy, right? And I started taking those perspectives of putting myself or myself into their shoes and trying to sell for them even before they became a partner yeah. of ours. Right. So by having that mentality and really sitting on the same side of the table as that prospect, that, that was step one of coming back to breaking down that rapport. Right. And, and if they're, if that rapport is established, then I'm going to be able to have that conversation with them. If it's not established or it, it hasn't even been the, the surface hasn't even been scratched at all, then there's no chance. You're not going to be able to have that conversation because trust isn't established. Um, so that's really, again, what it point boils down to, to me, um, when you're engaged in a sales, uh, you know, conversation with an, a prospect. Let's talk about meetings. Do you think yeah. that asking for meetings is, or does negatively affect people's pipelines, meaning that we live in an era where like the days of being like, do you got 20 minutes for a meeting are over and people should start saying like, Hey Matt, sorry to bother you. The reason why I called is just, I actually wanted to send you information. Do you mind if I, mm -hmm. I keep you in list and, 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 and just send you info? Like, do you think that people should take a look at the funnel and say, Hey, instead of making a SQL and those for listening, we SQL refer to a sale qualified lead. Do you think that it would make sense for people to say, why not get, marketing qualified leads? Why not ask people, can I, in, can mm -hmm. I connect with you on social media? Can I engage with your content? Can I share you stuff? Do you think there's an opportunity there for, for buyers of outsourced sales services to start um, actually looking at SDR work more as marketing, getting people in awareness funnel and, and setting different metrics or is it the meeting? Mm -hmm. Is it the meeting, meeting, meeting? Definitely. No, no, no. The meeting, I, I rarely it happens, but it does happen where, you know, I've sold deals without ever having a conversation with somebody or having that formal meeting with somebody. Um, it's rare. It's very rare. I wouldn't bank your metrics on it. Um, but ultimately what, what I would focus in on is the why. Um, cause if there's a meeting without a why two things happen, your show rate goes down, which you're going to have to account for, you know, on the back end, you can either account for it on the top end of the funnel or once it gets into the middle of the funnel, 
right? Once it's on your salesperson's plate and they're actually engaged with that individual. But if there isn't the why, then it isn't going to move in down that sales funnel. Yep. So the, the key there to me is, yeah, you want meetings, but you want meetings with a why. If you're just going out there and twisting arms just to hit a number, that's where buyers, quite frankly, and my partners get upset because then they're going on meetings and doing business card drop-offs. They're not being able to push people down their sales funnel um, and work their sales processes. It's actually going the opposite direction. But is that is that so, is that a symptom of the meeting request being the KPI, meaning that like if a salesperson had the ability to speak, email, LinkedIn, and justify, okay, this person is really not ready for a meeting. Let me make you an MQL. Mm -hmm. Like, is it because companies are like, get 15 meetings or you're fired and that, that creates, mm -hmm. that creates more waste? That's it. That's the, the crux. It's the goal of hitting a number, which a bonus is typically a tied to, which, you know, compensation is usually tied to. So the person individually, it, by nature is going to want to hit that number, right? Mm -hmm. It's just human nature to want to hit goals, not not hit goals, all that kind of stuff. So I would say that it's a uh, crux of, of finding out what the number really realistically should be. It's kind of those, those smart goals, if you will, it needs to be, you know, attainable yeah. for, for example, right. It can't just meet, be a pie in the sky number that just came out with no backing up of, of metrics. Right. And that's usually where the, the gap is in between management and the actual reps. Right. That's where they have to be really in tune with one another. This is coming from a guy who's who's built out multiple teams and I've had to manage reps on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, you know, consistently over the past 10 years. So usually that's where the, the rub is. And if you can break down that rub and you can be realistic with the numbers, then a couple of things happen. One, your reps become highly motivated because they know that they're, the goals are attainable. And then you're going to find your rock stars that are going to want to ultimately blow those numbers out of the water because they know that they're attainable and easy to get. And they're going to take that, that extra leap to go out and overachieve. Right. So that's, that's really where it's helped me as a manager kind of vet people out as well good fits and bad fits. So, so for anybody listening here who, who might be considering high, building their own internal team, right? Uh, what advice would you give them for like the number one to look out for when hiring an SDR and managing SDRs off the top of your mind? Cause you've also learned so much about that. Sure. Sure. So the, the number one thing is the willingness to do the work, right? The average life cycle of an SDR nowadays is six to 18 months. That's just overarching uh, industry agnostic people that are doing the building and cold calling um, sort of activities, that's their average life cycle. Mm -hmm. So it, it boils down to a couple things. One, are you accounting for that? Um, if so, you got to have redundancies in place, which are additional costs in order to ensure that the numbers are going to keep going. Um, so, you know, bigger organizations can account for that right in their numbers, but smaller SMBs, even in the mid market space, they can't account for it. They can't afford to because they just don't have the cash flow or, or have the right infrastructure, right technologies, right CRM system, right people to manage the activity, right? Because yeah. it's, it's kind of a babysitting job. You know, you have to make sure that the daily activities are done day in and day out every single day. Kind of like- At the very least. Good, at yeah, the very at least. The very and least. then you have to split <laughs> then you have to spill in some skill. And, and right, yeah. right, right. But you're right. not going to, so, you're never going to get there if you don't have the consistency. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So that's it. number one is getting the person that's willing to do that activity day in and day out. You can always mold and train them and you can educate them, which comes over time, right? Which you can control. But if they don't have the willingness or, or the wherewithal to deal with the hard job of, of dealing with rejection, then you've, you're going to waste your time. And then six months down the road, you're going to have to replace that person. Yeah. Right. And, and you're going to have to do the rip, replace, rinse and repeat type of stuff. Yeah. So like from you as a, as a sales leader who's trained and managed multiple people, like what do you notice that stands out? Is it a test you give people? Is it a question you ask? Is it a gut feeling? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. We've, and we've done it all. You know, we, we do have a well, test. I want to talk about we, I want to talk about Matt. <laughs> What about you? No, I've I I've used uh, the caliber uh, test. That's usually my step one. Um, anybody that scores above an 80, 85 percent usually has the right sales mentality there um, on that 
that particular assessment. Mm -hmm. So that's just to get in front of me. You got to kind of pass that test at that rate. Um, and then from there, it's, it's a matter of taking a look at track record, you know, taking a look at what they've done in the past. Um, I can ask them anything, but anyone can puff their chest up. Right. Anyone can say, you know, I've done this, I've done that um, without any sort of backing up um, of that or a track record that I can look at. Um, that's that's where I need to to kind of close the gap in my mind. Um, so, you know, having a, a track history of, you know, sales being completed, hitting numbers, being on president's clubs, um, that or if they're coming out of college, let's say, and you're in that sort of uh, labor pool. Um, looking for athletes, um, people that are, are highly motivated to hit numbers, but in a way that's self beneficial to take them to the next level. So you, so you like you athletes for the competitive nature, man or woman, competitive nature. Um, you know, I was a former athlete myself, so, so I kind of fall into that same vein, uh, being a former college soccer player, Damn but, right you um, were. This, uh, yeah, this all, uh, it ties into just having that right mindset. Like, listen, you, right? have the, you have the Under Armour athletic, uh, shirt. You're, you're ready to ball. And so I'm ready to play. Ready to ball. Get me, get me out there on the field. <laughs> yeah. It's the world cup right now. We got, I got to have my soccer plug in there. What is the number one KPI that SDRs and outsource SDR agencies should focus on in 2023? <laughs> Here, here's what I would say. And it, it might surprise some people because, um, you know, especially uh, some of our people here in, internally, they're going to say dials, right? Number of dials, that's the one thing that they can control. Um, that's their output, if you will. And, so and you're, are, you're already lining up, you're lining up the politically correct answer and the mat answer. I just want the mat answer. Uh -huh. What is the mat answer? Uh -huh. The mat the answer is um, number of people actually pitched. So if you look at that number and you're honest with yourself on how many people you're pitching, then you're going to be able to reverse engineer whatever number you need. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be able to know how many dials you need to make to get to the number of pitches to get to the number of closes that you need. You're going to be able to reverse engineer your close rate on the other end of the spectrum because you're going to be able to consistently be talking to the right people. And then you can therefore track what you can close if you talk to those people. So, it'll all come into um, perspective for the sales individual that's trying to hit that number. If they look at that metric versus dials first versus close business, if they're looking at the metric of, okay, I need to actually talk to the, this number of key decision makers, people that can actually sign the bottom line on a monthly basis, that'll lead them to the this, other two This areas. sounds just like meeting people in the real world. Hi, hi, how are you? My name is Matthew. Can I hang out with you? It's the same thing, huh? Right. A hundred percent. That's awesome. hundred percent. It's how big your pipeline is. So this is where it's going to get fun because I know that I know that the bigger the company is, the more companies you service and you've serviced everything from startups to enterprise, enterprise to startups, B2B to service. So I'm going to try to pigeonhole you into an answer. You can only pick one okay. customer, software mm -hmm. or service. Ooh, I looking at my current clients, it's service. Um, software is a newer area. I, I don't need an excuse. Into, I didn't so. ask for an excuse. Tell it's me, service. tell me why service. It's service. You're already trying to justify um, yourself. You're already justify monthly yourself. Monthly recurring revenue. Okay. Monthly recurring revenue. Okay. Stickiness. So once they get a client, they tend to keep a client for multi-year, and the average value of that client is greater. Service. So on high, high, high lifetime value for those listening. Right. What is, what is the value. average? What's the sweet spot that comes in? You you could pick your best client. What what is their average contract? That's LTV. That's a little bit confusing for some mm -hmm. listening. But what's like the average? Is it we're talking fifty thousand, ten thousand? The higher the better. Is there a sweet spot? Uh, higher the higher the better, obviously, because you know you get one and and all of a sudden there's the returns positive. Yeah. Um, but I would say our average is right around one to, to three grand on a monthly basis. Um, so yeah. anywhere from 20 to, to 50 grand on a service contract for a year. Um, that's really the majority of our partners. I'd say 80, 90. Oh, yeah, we, we got some, we have the mutual customers that are services. Now that I'm thinking of it, mm -hmm. that makes sense. That was yeah. got matched. Um, and those, for those listening, why, why it came so easy for Matt to say higher value is because Matt knows as a leader of an outsourced sales agency that, that they're measuring an ROI and our return on sales. So immediately he's like, 
instead of explaining all of the if ands and buts, the bigger deal makes it clearer to show the win, right? And that's mm -hmm. and that's actually the sad part is, is that oftentimes there's so much more value happening, there's so much more awareness, downloads, pick and bolts, but even getting measured on the most obvious low hanging fruit, you could still have a win, but you're going to really win because mm -hmm. let me tell you, the people that they call, email, and and um, LinkedIn. They might buy from you year two, year three, year four. People will buy from you when they need your product or service. And if a company professionally does the right thing and making them aware, and you might not measure the agency on that, but it sure as hell happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, how many times have you seen agencies oh, yeah. say, oh, we're coming back to you because we hired an outsourced sales agency six years ago and then we got a million dollar deal. We thought it didn't work and now we think it works. Have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. It actually, it, it is a double-edged sword for us because we work exclusively in each area. So I'll give you a hard example. Our, our cleaning partner in St. Louis three years ago ran the process for three, uh, three months, you know, gave it a, the good old 90 day try. Right. And we don't view it as a, a I guess, a sort of a trial period, if you will. We view this as a process, right? We're solving a, a problem that exists in most sales organizations, which is consistency. So with that being said, um, they ran it for 90 days got about 15 meetings for us, ran the meetings. None of those 15 meetings closed within that 90 days and they canceled, right? So we went and found another partner, right? It took us about 60 days to find that partner, establish the, the relationship. And then about nine months after the fact, exactly what you were saying, yeah. they came back to us saying, hey, we landed that second appointment you put us on. It closed um, six months after the fact, and it's our largest client now and and you're paid for. So let's re-engage and, and we can't it's too late because right? we found it. Yeah, we found a different partner. So for us, it's a double edged sword, but I, I can imagine for other agencies that don't have that that exclusivity piece, they probably see it far, far more than what we do. Yeah. Um, just by by nature of it. Well, I think this also it happens. happens it happens time. with agencies, but also happens with internal reps too, right? Like like you could hire internal totally. SDRs, fire them after ninety days, but he called his uncle at Nike, and now Nike's aware of it, right? So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. people don't buy for favors; they buy if it's faster, cheaper, more efficient. And if you got the right message, mm -hmm. the right person, there's no saying when they can come back. In fact, I had a call one time with a company named Fuck, I forget what it's called, some software company, and they never bought from me, never worked with mm -hmm. me, but they referred Google to us. At Google, you know, we became yeah. clients, so it was great. So just like if you hold your messaging, which you started with, right, mm -hmm. your offer consistent, mm -hmm. you measure your sales, your gross profit, your profits, there's a reason why you're, you're, you're hitting your sales goals. It's, and you sometimes can't mm -hmm. measure it, right? Like how often are leaders looking at website traffic and they're like, this came from abstract marketing. They, they don't know, right? There's so many tools mm -hmm. to know, but very few people know how to use those tools, including me. Like I, can't, right. I don't know where my traffic, I tried mm -hmm. looking at it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one of those, and it's, it's sad because it creates a lot of waste, but the whole, the whole point is that we're here to help people, right? So I think people listening to this, yeah. if you're a uh, service company with a high average contract value, you love exclusivity, you love US-based companies, um, where can they find you, Matt? How can they engage with you guys? Uh, yeah. How can they reach you? Well, get in touch with me. Um, you know, I've, I've got a link on our website where, you know, my face is on the website, but, um, if you want to get in touch with me directly, um, all, all of my contact information, uh, Amir's got it. He can send it out to any channel partners. Um, feel free to email me, connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm highly active in those areas. Um, and then always phone calls the best, right? So give me a buzz, you know, shoot me a message on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. I promise I'll respond and we'll get some time on the calendar to talk in further depth. Matt, you're the man and everybody listening. Thank you for tuning in to the Transformer Sales Podcast. We got Matt with from Abstract Marketing and Nelly's, Nelly's Studio, guys. He brought out Nelly's Studio for this. It's very special. Um, thank you for tuning in. Matt, thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure.